We're joined at uh, the European Business Summit here in Brussels by Jacqueline McGlade, uh, Executive Director of the European Environment Agency. You've been speaking here at a session on climate change, uh, the road to Copenhagen, about um, water shortages that we could be facing. How critical a problem is that? I think it's the hidden underbelly of climate change and it is absolutely critical. If we look across Europe right now, we would see that there are at least 10 to 20 percent of the countries who are in critical states of water shortage. I won't call it a drought, but certainly scarce water. And there are many countries that have gone beyond what we consider safe, a 20 percent exploitation level. So somewhere between 20 and 50 percent. What that means is that they're using 50 percent of the water that falls on the territory for abstraction which means it's not replenishing the systems, it's not going into the groundwater, and it's not available then for households for drinking water and so on. And you're saying that we really have to change our mindset. It's not only the mindset of how we actually deal with water today um, and how we divide it up, but it's actually about moving away from a demand economy for water to supply. So we've really said, you can have everything you want. We'll put a meter on your wall and we'll just measure it and then we'll put a price on it. We're fast moving to a situation where having the meter isn't enough because no matter how carefully you think you can use water, the supplies just simply won't be there. You were also talking about uh, solar power, wind power, uh, the advantages and the, the potential growth in those areas. We have, as a result of the various incentive packages across Europe and, and worldwide, seen amazing take-up of renewable energy, um, both in wind, wave, water uh, and also solar. But I think the, the real crunch is now coming where we have to pitch the learning curves of renewable energy, renewable energy against traditional forms. But what is very encouraging is that if you see in Europe, for example, the relative amounts of indigenous sources of energy and put those alongside nuclear, coal, oil and gas, they perform very well. We've just put out a wind potential map which shows that taking into account all the legislation for nature and so on, we can still produce two and a half times the amount of electricity that is currently consumed within the European Union. So the potential is there. What we lack are the grids that get you from the outposts of Europe into either manufacturing centres or to a relatively large set of communities. Presumably there's a lot of money to be made uh, by companies going into these areas. There's a lot of money to be made, but not just by the companies that provide the installation. We have already examples in Europe of communities that basically bought into the idea 10, 15 years ago. Not only are they energy independent, they're so to speak off the grid, we have them entirely using renewable sources. One, for example, in Denmark, Tistel, has wind, wave, biomass, geothermal, produces so much energy that it actually exports out from the community into the grid, and each person in the commune pays virtually nothing for their energy. So the extra money then goes in to build hospitals, schools. Uh, the fish plant, for example, is entirely self-sufficient. So actually there's money to be made and money not to be spent, if you balance the two, all over Europe, in fact all over the world, in getting this just right. Do you think that people are starting to get the climate change message? I think in the, amongst the elites, the sort of discussions, even here at the Business Summit, I would consider most people here to be aware of climate change. What I think is still missing is the understanding of the urgency. We've heard in Europe that there's going to be attempts to stick at a target of a two degree rise in temperature associated with climate change gases. From our calculations, actually that's even too much. One degree will radically take us outside of our comfort zone for growing crops, the way our buildings work, the way we actually consume and move around. And I think it's that, the connection of the enormity of the problem and the urgency that is still yet to bite. What about the sceptics, though, the people who are saying that um, you know, there is no real evidence of climate change? Well, I think at this stage I have to say that they are doomed. There is so much evidence that the whole of the globe is warming. Um, there are people who say it's cooling, it's cooled before, but actually there is no systemic evidence of that at a global level. And I, I have to say that those sceptics are digging themselves a very early grave. And it's not that we wouldn't listen to alternative views, quite the opposite. We, we want to have as much knowledge to be able to act as possible. But when we meet people from remote regions, like in the Arctic, 
in the Amazon jungle, where they're seeing on a day-by-day -day basis, in a very subtle way, these changes, then we know it's eating into the core of the planet everywhere. So I would say to those skeptics, come and join us, because otherwise you'll be in a very lonely place very soon. Is this uh, an issue that basically the governments are going to have to lead on, or is it uh, in combination with the private sector and maybe NGOs? What I think we need is a new governance model which puts government in the right place. So it's a balancing between what we would call the sort of Keynesian world and the, and the privatization of utilities, of, of, of water resources and so on. But we need to balance those two with a much more proactive parliament, a kind of parliamentary process looking after the common good and an engagement with the public. No longer the idea that, oh, well, we can't do anything, everyone else will take care of it. And we need those four, public participation and the public good at the core. So government has a part to play, but it's really to enact better legislation that allows the private goods and the, and the public goods to come together. Just a few moments ago off camera, you were saying that there are a lot of business opportunities that have yet to be realised. What, what do you mean by that? I do think that the idea that we can only solve this by big inputs, for example, of power and electricity, that having a central grid with a nuclear power station, with coal-fired power stations, you know, this is the solution. No, that's easy for government because it requires very few decisions. But in fact, the business opportunities come from creating the internet of energy, the internet of water, distributing responsibilities and roles out into small scale. And so the fundamental issue, for example, on carbon capture and sequestration, is that maybe we don't need big coal-fired power stations. What we actually need is to scale things back. So the business opportunities come from sensing the environment, creating, for example, grids for electric cars to run on, for improving our buildings, and so on and so forth. There are millions and millions of local opportunities which are done then not in a globalised language, but which then become locally entrained into the cultures in every language that we have, 25 languages across the EEA countries, um, means that there's a lot more to be gained, translating ideas into what you can do in your neighbourhood. Jacqueline McLeod, thanks for joining us. Thank you very much.